Joining us today is Rosalind Wiseman, who is a multiple New York Times bestselling author whose publications include Queen Bees and Wannabes, Helping Your Daughter Survive Clicks, Gossip, Boyfriends, and the New Realities of Girl World. And that was the basis for the movie Mean Girls. In the fall of 2022, Rosalind and co-author Shantara McBride will publish Courageous Discomfort, How to Have Brave, Life-Changing Conversations about Race and Racism by Chronicle Books. Rosalind is the co-founder of Cultures of Dignity, and she has been profiled in or written for the New York Times, Time, and the Washington Post, among others, and appeared on the Today Show, CNN, Good Morning America, and National Public Radio. So thank you very much, Rosalind, for taking some time out today. Thanks for having me, Lee. Well, we like a backstory when we uh, start our specialist series, so we'd like to know where your expertise came from, and let's start off with what inspired you to write several of your books about adolescent behavior. Mm, yes. Well, when I first started, I wasn't that much older than the young people that I was studying. I was 21 when I first started doing this work. And, um, you know, it's been amazing. I think my fascination with watching groups and group dynamics and how individuals make decisions within groups has always been the thing that has driven me. And uh, for, for a long time, I've been studying young people, middle school, upper elementary school, middle school, and high school people. Um, and then explaining the other part too, for my backstory is that because I think I started at such a young age, um, I was always acutely aware of the things that we were telling young people, but we were not giving the skills for young people to actually be able to do the things that we were asking them to do. And I was um, focused on the inconsistent messaging sometimes that adults, for the best of intentions sometimes, um, will give young people and being able to be honest about the things that we do so that young people take us seriously. So I think that's really, in general, that's my backstory, is I was fascinated from a very early age in studying group dynamics. Uh, and, and definitely your, your work is, is prolific in that area. Could you tell us about uh, also about how you founded Cultures of Dignity and how you came up with its name and what is its overall mission? Sure. So I started Cultures of Dignity, co-founded it about nine years ago. And the reason was because I had been doing um, more and more work as somebody who was writing books pretty much exclusively and, um, and doing things in a, in a public fashion. And when you work in education, for those people who are listening to this, um, you know, is that how fast you lose touch with the work when you are not doing the work. And I was acutely aware of writing books. And yes, I was working with young people. And yes, young people have always uh, vetted everything that I've written. But I was acutely aware of very quickly when I was out of schools and out of the day-to-day -day schools. I had been teaching in some capacity for many years. And then I stopped because I was doing so much writing and speaking. And I knew that I was losing touch with what it was like to understand walkie talkies or schedules of schools. I mean, goodness knows you can be in school for a long time and not understand the schedule of school. Um, but it was, it was really important to me that I understand what were the challenges for teachers about why it was difficult to sometimes create a sense of belonging in a classroom or to do the things that teachers said they wanted to do, but they felt that they just, that they couldn't. Um, and so I really wanted to understand more what that was about. And so I started Cultures of Dignity as a way to not do things in such a public manner, but to get much more granular and listen more to educators about what they needed in the day to day of bringing social emotional learning into the schools. And so I started that um, and with my co-founder, Charlie Kuhn. And um, Cultures to this day continues to work with and for young people and for the people who care for them. And what about the name? Oh, the yes. Yeah. So this goes back to when I said, when you asked me what my backstory was about respect and about the things that we sometimes will tell young people, but we don't act on it, or we don't really understand the impact of what we're saying to young people or how young people are hearing what we're saying. And that's really important to me because 
I can study and think about how am I going to deliver information to young people and young people have always been, this is just true pretty much across the board is that young people can be really cynical about programs that have anything to do with character or talking about your feelings or articulating when you're feeling angry, anything like that after about fourth grade or your, um, you know, 10 years of age, young people get pretty cynical about what they're doing. And especially young people of high social status or high social power tend to think of those programs um, with the least amount of um, appreciation. So I really wanted to understand why. And I also understood quite quickly that the word respect often in Western cultures, especially meant a relationship, what they were describing was a relationship of power that one person had had more power than another person. And that person who had more power or more authority had the right to treat that person with less power pretty much however they wanted. Or there was this, there was this thing that happened where people who had less power felt that they could not speak against somebody who had more um, respect or more authority. And that really connected to education and, um, and to the way in which we teach young people. And young people will often say, I'm not going to give respect until I get respect first. And adults tend to really dislike that. Um, they tend to think, you know, what's going on with these entitled kids? You know, this is, they need to respect me when I walk in the room. But the reality is, is that young people consistently have experiences with, with adults who are in positions of respect that don't merit their respect because of the way the adult treats other people. And we don't create a lot of space for young people to be able to talk about those experiences. So for me, respect was really important to be able to unpack, especially with young people who are disenfranchised or disempowered for other, for many reasons, for identity reasons, race, gender, ethnicity, religion, that if they were marginalized that with less power, this would be even more important to them, more salient in their lives. So dignity for me was the path forward that separating those two words, which we often conflate respect and dignity is the same, and they're not. Respect is about admiring someone's achievements and how they have achieved them. And dignity is about recognizing the self-worth of someone, the essential worth. So dignity is a given, respect is earned. And I wanted to create a culture of dignity. I did not necessarily want to create a culture of respect because in our culture, that is so often about compliance and control. And it's not what I, that is the opposite of what I really wanted to do. And the irony is, is that when we talk about the reality of respect or the, the complexity of it, and we understand the definition of it, it's not about taking away the power of the word. It's actually about giving power back to the word respect so that when young people really say like, I respect you, that they know where that's coming from. And, um, and, but they always know, no matter what they feel, that people, they need to be treated and they need to treat others with essential worth. So being able to separate those two things, I have found to be profoundly important when we talk to young people. And I think that's really important what you've done to differentiate and, and to separate that because it's so true um, with the nuances and, and how we define respect. It, it does have that sense of discipline and, and control that needs to be looked at so it, it's great that you you created your cultures of dignity understanding that mm, that's not where we need to go here mm -hmm. so in the international middle years curriculum or imyc we are turning to experts quite like yourself to help look at some of the learning goals we devised for health and well-being so in the strand of growing and changing we highlight the importance of relationships among peers self-worth and identity in adolescence so with Cultures of Dignity, you have accomplished some excellent work in regard Thanks. to these areas. So with your research and expertise, what individuals or groups can affect and influence teenage behavior and their sense of self-worth the yeah. most? So there's so many different answers to this question. I was thinking about it today and in preparation for our talk. And, you know, obviously the thing that the group that is going to influence them and the research obviously backs it up is their peers, is their peer group. But I think we need to dig a little deeper, which is that I think because of social media, and this would be another easy answer for me, right? Like easy answer is it's the peer group. And then the second easy answer is it's social media. But I think we need to dig a little bit deeper there and to the connection between the two, 
which is that my experience with young people is that they are trying to please and what I would call an invisible audience, that they have this perception when they post something or when they, um, when they interact in any capacity in social media, that they've got this invisible audience that they're trying to please. And that audience has a script and they're getting that from sort of these cultural messages that they're getting in all different kinds of ways, all different kinds of capacities. But what I have found to be really challenging is young people constantly having, constantly thinking about what, and not in a positive way, about what do I have to do so that my peers will accept me on these mediums? Or what are the things that I have to do in very complex and very sometimes complex moral um, problems and conflicts that they get into with their peers? And so they're constantly thinking about how to please this group of people, but they're not actually having the conversation with the people that they are in the most close proximity with and the most deep relationship with. So it gives a tremendous amount of power to this invisible audience. And I think it, one of the most complicated things about that is that it's really hard to put into words and then not only know, know how to put it to words, but then do something about it. So, and you know, when the invisible audience becomes visible, when you get reactions from people, both pro and con, and sometimes in social media and sometimes in your real life. So, so I think in answer to your question, we've got to get to like, yes, the easy answers are true, but in order to understand the context in which young people are living, we have to really dig deeper into what does that really look like? Um, and then, and of course, talk to them and ask them, like, am I right? Am I wrong? What do I, th what do you think about this? So that we can get some context for them that makes sense. Um, because if we say to a group of, you know, young people, well, what's most important in influencing you, your peers and social media, they're like, yeah, okay, sure. Yes, I agree. But how do we bring it to life for them? I think is, is the most important. Uh, and yeah, that's powerful to think about that invisible audience. Um, I've never thought of that. And yeah. And it's, it is, it's, you're right, it's so much more than just a couple of answers there. It has a lot of nuances. So what types of identities are the most limiting for teenagers to adopt? Ooh. And how can schools help with yeah. encouraging and celebrating students' sense of self oh or self-worth? Oh my gosh, -worth? this is such a question. Um, you know, one that I think about a lot. And, you know, it's, this is really a tough one for me because it's like we could talk about this one for hours because young people are going through a understandable, healthy, appropriately, you know, developmentally appropriate experience of what are their identities. And one of the most wonderful but, but painful and comfortable things about adolescence is that you get to try on different identities. And, um, and then there are some that are to, you know, you, and maybe you don't feel comfortable sharing them with other people for various reasons. And some that you claim because you think you have to, you have to have a kind of identity. Um, and which is often tied to social status or pleasing the adults in your life and can be really incongruous with what you feel and what you want. And so, and then a lot of times what is amazing to me and what I am fascinated by with young people is that they the the need and the focus on identity for young people is so important and it is so connected to their to their development and we're living in a world where people are wanting to claim identity and really hold on to that identity in ways that if we took a step back i wonder and I, like i wonder i'm curious about if young people could see it as a way of why am i boxing myself in in any way and those are the questions that I don't have the answers for, but I do think it's a really important question to be asking young people because I want them to have the freedom to be able to try on new things and to admit and acknowledge to the adults in their lives or their friends or whoever important people in their lives to themselves that if they are boxing themselves in, that they can acknowledge it and then do things to give themselves a little bit more space. And, um, and that, that really can be anything from a young person who was, an, is an amazing athlete and really wants to try out for theater, but is seen as like the jockey kid. So doesn't want to, you know, leave that box because his parents, their parents or 
so focused on the, you know, success that their child has, those kinds of things. To um, Or what if the theater kid wants to do something that's not like the theater kids don't usually do, like a particular sport, like it goes both ways, right? It's not one way or the other. But um, so it could be the things that kids are interested in, but, but are tied to identity, but it also could be what young, how young people are identifying. Um, and I, I think it's a really important question to ask young people about what are the identities that you really feel are you and why is that important to you and how do you want to carry that with you as you as you get older? So I just I, I think we need to be really listening to young people about how they see it and then giving advice to them about I don't think anybody really wants to be boxed in. There are wonderful things about identities and labels and labels can also help you understand your own behavior better, but they can sometimes be really um stultifying and really, you know, they, they close you down because you have these expectations about what you, no matter what the identity is, sometimes it can feel like I have to be a certain way to match that identity. So all to say, I think these are really important questions and conversations we can, we should be having with young people. The unfortunate thing is we don't live in a culture very much that allows us to do that. Um, so I think it's important for educators to be able to create the space to be able to do that, to be able to create the space for dialogue for the young person, for themselves and for other people. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, with your work with Cultures of Dignity. I mean, is that something that you've seen over the years, the sense of what identity is and how that's shifted as well? Yeah, like, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think um you know, I have spent 25 years wanting young people and advocating for young people to have a voice, 100%. And I worry about young people feeling like they have to choose an identity of, of different things. Like, what's the difference between, and, you know, this is really hard. Like, I could, you know, it's um, difficult to say these kinds of things. Um, but I really think young people need to ask themselves what is the difference between identity and boxing myself in? Or what is the connection between the identity I want to choose and the expectations I have about myself and my behavior or the people that I hang out with or the positions or opinions that I'm supposed to have along with that? Um, I want young people to be challenging themselves because it's so easy um, to get to a place where we feel like we have to do certain things to meet a certain criteria of who we're supposed to be. And when we do that, we really, um, we don't take the risks we're supposed to, that we should take that we say like, huh, you know, this is, you know, like, I'm going to think about things in a different way or yeah, I have this particular identity, but that's not all I am. I'm other things too. Um, and I think recognizing the gift of being able to be many things is a, is a wonderful, wonderful thing for young people. Yeah. And what you're saying too, there's, there can be that safety, isn't there? And that totally. Really boxing yourself in. Yeah. And then there's safety and identity. Like yeah. this is who I am. Right. And there's pride yeah. in that. And that's amazing. Um, and as you know, my bottom line that I always tell young people is, you know, bottom line is you treat yourself and other people with dignity. So, you know, so if the identity is that you're aligning yourself with, or, you know, with a, with a way of being that doesn't treat people with dignity, then I would have, you know, I'm going to have some things to say about that. Like I'm going to have a lot of questions for that young person um, and for anybody, frankly, right. Not just young people, but, um, but as long as that, that's the bottom line, that is the bottom line. And then throughout the process, as young people develop and question themselves, I want young people being able to have the space to be able to question themselves, make mistakes, whatever, however they define that repair, um, have developed self-compassion and then also have compassion for others. So, you know, I, I want them to be able to take risks that feel appropriately scary, but are good for them. So they feel that they've, mm -hmm. you know, that they're, that they have pride over facing things that are hard for them and that they feel their identity is tied to that, that I do things that are hard and I face things that are hard. That that's really, no matter what, that's really something I think is important for us to be paving the way for young people and working with them on. Love that. Well, I recently read a newspaper article where you wisely stated to a student, 
you can't make someone be your best friend. Mm. So since teenage social dynamics can be challenging and may lead to bullying, in your experience, what do you think education needs more of to better help our youth with creating better friendships amongst peers? Or what isn't being taught in mm. regards to relationships but should be? So each one of these questions is so big. It's so They're so deep. <laughs> um, so, you know, I... There's so many ways to answer this question, but I think for a teacher is to be able to really hone in on creating a sense of belonging in a classroom, regardless of what they teach, is the most important thing. And, um, you know, when we say, like, not everybody can be your best friend, like, you know, kids are obviously going to have ups and downs in their friendships and conflicts in their friendships and power dynamics in their friendships. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. That's human behavior. Uh, what happens is, you know, it, within this messiness is people are figuring out how to behave with each other and that, and within that, that can get really, really messy and hurtful and young people, you know, so you can't force somebody to be your best friend. You know, there are kids who have been really close and then as they get older, friendships change and then it feel one person feels rejected and then they're like really trying to figure out how to repair the relationship so they had it before and my comment about that from the interview you're talking about is that you cannot force like what i say to young people is you can obviously you can't force somebody to be your friend and even if you did would you want that friendship under what circumstances are you then accepting this friendship that you will and also how do you think this friendship is going to go if, if you actually got what you wanted, which is this person is now like your, you know, is your friends again, well, what does that mean about what your friendship's going to be like? And what was it like beforehand? Were you actually happy in this friendship beforehand? Or were there things that were not so great in this friendship? So you get to create standards for yourself, regardless of who it is, about what kind of relationship you want. And I think that gives autonomy and a sense of a sense of autonomy and self agency to young people when they have friendships that feel that are out of their control, and that they've changed and, so, and there's nothing they can do about it. And that's really upsetting to young people, understandably. So they need a sense of self agency. But when we think about it in terms of teachers, I think we don't. We really need to not see social emotional learning as a program but as something that all teachers understand the importance of for academic engagement and the right kind of risk taking. So all teachers, and I teach all over the place, all different kinds of schools all over the world, all teachers can relate to two things happening in the classroom. One is a child comes in to the classroom and they're dysregulated, they're, emo they're upset, they're angry, they're annoyed, or maybe they're just you know on the opposite, they're just woo, like totally just over the moon messing. But something happened before the classroom that is impacting their behavior now and is impacting the social dynamics in the classroom. All teachers can relate to that. Second is something happens in the classroom, in the peer dynamics that impacts young people's ability to learn and feel safe taking academic risks because they don't want to raise their hand or they don't want to contribute because they might be wrong and maybe they'll be ridiculed or whatever. So creating, because all teachers have those experiences, I think that's a really good example of social emotional learning is not a program. It is the classroom right. and creating a sense of belonging and knowing how to do that from the very beginning and then continuing to do it throughout the year is absolutely how the magic of teaching happens, regardless if it's maths or um, Spanish or geography or social studies or English or what, art, whatever it is. We have to have that. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of teachers have not been taught that and about how to do it. And so that can be, it can feel overwhelming to teachers like, oh, this isn't what I'm doing. Like I'm a math teacher. Well, actually you're a teacher creating a sense of belonging in a classroom so young people can take the academic risks they need to take. Oh yeah, I, I like that. That's, that's a quotable right there. And you mentioned a lot about that creating space. It's so true. And I, I wonder how conscious educators are about that. Mm. You know? I think, Making I think they're conscious when they don't personal. have it. I mean, I think at the beginning of the yeah. school year, teachers, you know, a lot of teachers, especially in middle school and younger love, love to create their classrooms. Like right now, you know, there are teachers setting up their classrooms, like all over the world, like very excited with all, you know, teachers right. love that kind of stuff. Um, 
there's some high school teachers, I think, who like to do that too. They do it in a different way, but, <laughs> but, but, um, but I think, so they do that and they're like, okay, I'm going to create, I'm going to do a new thing. I'm going to do new seating assignments or new this or new that. But then, you know, after a couple of days, you go into the kind of, you know, kind of thing of, of teaching. And I think this is where the issue of dignity is really important because you, you as a teacher need to share that you, that you believe in the essential worth of every child in that room and that you are going to uphold that if, if for whatever reason that's not happening, you want to know it so that you can help to regain that in the room, in the space. And, um, and there's a lot of things that go along with that. Like, for example, um, appropriate sharing. Like, you know, there's a whole thing for teachers about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate to share. Like, we don't want to share that we've gone through, like, a, a, we are breaking up with our significant other, right? And we can, barely can think through the day. Not an appropriate share. You can say you've had a hard day, but you don't want to go into the de details of that. Appropriate share would be, for example, what we do in Cultures of Dignity is we have teachers and students, um, ideally in the beginning of the year, but you can do it at any time, um, write, draw, we, draw what dignity looks like to you and what respect looks like to you. I don't care how old the kids are. I mean, high school kids, we often think oh, they're too cool to do like drawing stuff, but yeah, I think we often skip over how important drawing can be for learning, but teachers should be doing that. And so we know it's one thing to have rules and class norms and expectations. It's all whole different that the first thing that you do with your students is you draw what, right, what dignity and respect looks like to you they see what you're doing. You might explain why you feel or drew, you know, what you, you explain why you drew, you drew what you did. That is a very appropriate share. And it's also very intimate. It's a very private thing to talk about what dignity looks like to you. And yet in just a, in a moment, your explanation shows uh, young people where your heart is and that transcends, that creates a sense of belonging in the classroom. Oh, brilliant. Um, well, your work has tackled several key struggles that teenagers face during their learning and social dynamics among their peers. So as many schools shifted online during the pandemic, what other issues do you foresee for students as virtual learning becomes more evident in the future? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think yeah, lots of kids will go back and forth between hybrid and on uh, hybrid and and in-person learning. I think they want in-person, for the ma vast majority of students that I work with, want in-person learning. Um, and they miss their peers, right? As much as the complexities of peer relationships are, they miss their peers. The vast majority of young people that I work with. Um, you know, I, I think we're going to have to look at, we're now in our, sorry, we're beginning our second year, you know, of processing being post code with COVID, not post COVID, with COVID. And um, I know that a lot of young people were acting in ways like grade nines, ninth graders were acting like they were in seventh grade and ninth grade teachers were thinking, what in the world is happening with these kids? They're so, not only are they like disciplinary stuff off the charts, but they were just acting so silly. And you would, so if you say to teachers, like just, just, just pause for a second. And just remember at this moment that at this moment that they're in grade seven, they're not in grade nine, they're going to get there, but like they, they, they're acting like they're in grade seven because for good, for good reason. And so we need to watch and see as their development shifts, because obviously it's going to go, you know, it's like, it's getting better. I think it's getting better um, in some ways, some things um, with them being back more amongst their peers, but they're going to need a lot of support. And that does not mean focusing on what we're, what they lost, what they lost like academically. It is focusing on what their emotional needs are so their brains can calm down so they can focus on their schoolwork. If we focus on catching up, catching up, catching up and what they lost, we're going to lose a lot more than their academic readiness. Mm. I think we're seeing that already, right? I mean, honestly, yeah. like kids are really, it's not like they're not telling us how they feel. <laughs> it's not like, it's not like we don't know. They are literally telling us like all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And do you think the sense of loneliness has 
is something that is kind of also creeping in here too, yeah, as we see definitely. With shift, I, yeah, with the peers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do, and I think that they fear it. I think that they know what it feels like to be isolated like that. Um, I mm. think you know there are kids. Um, who had different, you know, there's just such a vast ex difference of experiences of young people around the world. So there are young people in the United States who, you know, they didn't go to school for some amount of time, but they, their experience of that was much, much different. There's a lot of fighting about masks versus not masks. And then there were people who weren't, you know, that there was a whole group of people that had a very different experience than like kids in Shanghai or kids in Hong Kong or kids in so many places and i have students i work with in um um in ghana and in oh my gosh and in south america who were you know online school for two years so i think we have to really listen to them about like if you what school you're working with to really listen to young people about their feelings of isolation and what their experiences were and speak to them and teach to them based on what they're telling you is their context. I, I really think that's going to be the key to this, to helping them. Yeah. Yeah. So important that, that listening element that you're referring to and, and making that space, going back to what you said too, for that. Mm -hmm. You do so know you, when the, you, you don't stay. have the space. Yeah. That is true. Because when, the, when, this, when yeah. the classroom starts running off the rails and you start not liking to be there, that would be a good indicator. <laughs> There's lots of teachers, you know, let's admit it. You're like, oh gosh, I don't want to go back to school today. Like you start, you know, if you have fourth period on Wednesday, a particular class or, or whatever, every day of fourth period, and that's your, your class, your challenging class, and you start dreading it, waking up at two o'clock in the morning, dreading that class, that is not good. That is not good for anybody, including you. Yeah, and it's kind of looking and saying, how do I go back and create space? I mean, we can always create space. Ah. It's just going back and being. Yes. Right. And being vulnerable in front yeah. of these people. It's just awful. Yes. It's like, it's like, <laughs> I mean, my least favorite, right. Is to go back to a group of students and say, okay, so this clearly isn't working. <laughs> so I'm clearly not doing a good job here. So can we, let's figure out how, we can work together to um, to make this better. I don't like going into a group of seventh grade students and saying, yeah, I'm not doing a good job here. That's not fun. Cause some of them will like go, yes, we're gonna even more, right? It's gonna be a boundary. They're gonna push the boundary even more, which is developmentally appropriate, but super not fun to deal with as an adult. Yeah, but it's honest. But it's honest, yeah. right, right. Yeah. It's honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you say in your book, Masterminds and Wingmen, helping our boys cope with schoolyard power, locker room tests, girlfriends, and the new rules of boy world, quote, we often make the mistake of believing that if a boy doesn't come to us with problems, then he doesn't have them. So what are some of the best ways a teacher can approach a student to help them speak about a potential concern or issue? Yeah. Okay. So this is, I think this is sort of easy. Um, except the teachers have, a, and I count myself as one of them, is that this is really hard for me, which is you have to have faith that an opportunity will arise where organically you will be able to talk to this child in a way that is fluid, has some flow, can you can go in and out of it, right? I mean, and I really, I am guilty of this, where I'm like, okay, I have to talk to this child right now, and I have to create this thing, and you think about it, and you're like, you got to give yourself some faith that it's going to happen. An opportunity will arise where you will be able to speak to this, this child. Um, so I, so in general, I think that unless it's a significant disciplinary problem, and that's a whole different answer is that you, um, you know, you're walking down the hallway with this child and you say, Hey, like your shoes or, you know, if they have, if they have a new haircut, definitely want to like, Hey, nice, nice haircut, something. And then say, you know, Hey, this thing that, um, I just want you to know, saw this thing that happened in class today. I, I, I don't know. I wouldn't, here's an example of something. Um, the teacher said, see something, not quite sure. The kid says, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Okay. So what do you do about that? Cause you want to like trust your gut, but you don't want to make a big scene about it. You don't want to be like, I need to talk to you. Cause then the kid will freak out. Maybe not talk to you. So how do you do it? You're walking down the hallway and you see him, you go like, Hey, you know, this thing happened in class today, but, and I saw something, but I could be totally wrong. I could be completely wrong. So wrong. But um, I wouldn't have, if it had happened to me, I wouldn't have liked it. So I just wanted to run it by you. So this is what I saw. 
say what you saw. You're walking down the hallway. You're not making a big deal of things. Everything's going past you, a million kids, whatever. Um, and the kid will say, like, not usually the child's going to say, like, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. It's cool, whatever. And, and then you can say, yeah, okay, that's fine. But, you know, I just want to say, like, if I'm right about what I saw, that wouldn't have been okay. That wouldn't have been okay with me. And you know you can always talk to me if things change, if you change your mind. Great. And then you leave. You leave. You walk away. <laughs> And, um, and really the thing that's really important is you're saying, I see you. That's what you're doing. You're saying, I see you. I see you in class. It matters to me. And I also notice and think about, and I'm giving you the respect of your situation, right? I'm like, you're the situation you have to work in. Um, the, I don't want to be calling you out and causing you even more stress. So I'm just going to keep this really casual and really informal. And then just say like, Hey, if you ever want to talk to me, I'm here. And then you walk away walk away. <laughs> uh, and I love that. I love that because it's addressing it, but it's not putting too much emphasis on it. No, uh, teachers are scary. Like We're scary, especially yeah. if we care a lot. <laughs> you know, we got these like super intense yeah. eyes and we want to talk about stuff and it's like, <laughs> and the kid's like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Like, no, I don't want to talk to this person about, right? It's, it, or even worse, if you like really come across as a loving and tender hearted person and then the kid picks up on it and they're walking down the hallway and you're like super, super intense. And then what if they get really upset and then they're in the hallway and they're really upset and they don't know what to do with their feelings. Like you gotta be mindful of the feelings that we bring up for them. And I think that's a really important thing to remember is what the, the world that they're living in, not the world that we are living in with them. Great, great quotable there too. So I understand, Rosalind, you, along with Shantara McBride, have co-authored a book, Courageous Discomfort, and how to have brave, life-changing conversations about race and racism. And it's set to be published by Chronicle Books shortly. Could you tell us a little well, bit about Well, thank you, that? Lee. Um, yeah, so this is the first book that I have written, general like publication type book, uh, since 2016. And not like a social emotional learning curriculum. Like I've, I've been doing that a lot <laughs> since 2016. But this is also the first not exclusively parenting book that I've written. So and it's the first book that I've written with someone else. So there's a lot of firsts here. It's the first book I've written specifically mm -hmm. about race um, in Queen Bees and Wannabes and in Masterminds and Wingman. There's um, things about, there's always been um, a lot of content about race. Um, but this is the first one that I did. And here's what I'm excited about. It's the first time that I have explicitly, um, in a general way, tied the social emotional learning tactics that we have and that we know how to do in schools, some of us teach on it, and connect it to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that we not only are teaching on the content, but we're teaching people the skills to be able to talk about the content because we often do not do that. And when we don't do it, we set up people to react poorly or to be emotionally dysregulated or to be emotionally hijacked or to be worried about what they're gonna say and their anxiety goes up and their, you know, how they respond with anger and frustration, all that stuff. And they don't have the education for themselves about, oh, what's happening right now is that I am not maintaining, I'm not regulating myself really well, or I'm having a really overwhelming feeling, but feelings, feelings pass. I can moderate my feelings. I can modify them. I can think about them in different ways. And this is what emotions are. And this is the purpose of them. And this is what feelings are. So it is really my attempt to contribute in a much more explicit way about the connection between social emotional learning tactics and the content of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm doing it with a, a friend of mine that I've known and worked in some capacity with or supported each other's work for more than 25 years. And we've been doing this work and talking about these issues for so long. And we felt um, about a year and a half ago that it was important for us to do what we could to contribute to giving people very common sense strategies that they can use in their workplace, in their families, anywhere, um, when they're in relationship with people and they are trying to address the issues of race, discrimination, racism, um, difference in their lives. And so that's what the book is. The book is based on 20 questions people have asked us the most over the years. 
And then what we do, because we're both basically teachers, is we have a story. We unpack the story about what's really going on. And then we give you, here's how we would handle it. We don't have the truth, but we have a particular way of looking at things and at, based on a lot of experience. And so here's what we would do in this situation. And here are the key takeaways. So for those of you who are educators, you will, this will very much be like, oh yeah, of course, when you read, hopefully when you read this book, that you will think, oh yeah, clearly these people are teachers who, um, who wrote it. Brilliant. And I love how you've got a story and you unpack it because it's great to kind of, you, you can relate yeah, to it, you know, telling absolutely. The story. We yeah. want people to read it and go, oh, I, I've been there. I know that. I know that feeling. Ugh, right. And, it, and I didn't want to have that feeling. And so I got rid of it as quickly as possible or whatever. I, you know, I, I didn't want to talk to that person or wh all the things that we do with these issues now. And so, yeah, we wanted to be able to give people a way forward that made people co closer to each other instead of farther apart. Brilliant. Uh, I look forward to, to, Thank you. to reading it. Well, you've given us so much to think about. I love the, you know, your advice, your stories, and we like to end on a takeaway. So if there is anything, is there one takeaway you would like the listeners and viewers to know about your writing, your work with cultures of dignity, or your decades of experience with adolescent behavior and social dynamics? What would it be? Well, I mean, for all of the teachers, for all the educators out there, I think what's really important is to remember that we get to be treated with dignity. And we, we are in a profession that is so focused on helping other people uh, that we sometimes forget that we ourselves deserve to be treated with dignity. And I think that we can and often are in very difficult situations with people that are stressed, anxious, um, and that can come across as being very angry or self-righteous or anything like that. And I want us to remember that while we all we have a responsibility to treat people with dignity, we we have an equal responsibility to treat ourselves that way as well. Absolutely, well said, well said. Well, I'd like to thank you, Rosalind, for taking some You're time welcome. out today and to answer some of our questions. And for those who are listening or watching. Um, this September, September 27th, The Courageous Discomfort by Rosalind Wiseman and um, Shantara McBride will be out. You can also visit the website, CourageousDiscomfort.com, to find out more information. And if you'd like to know more information about Cultures of Dignity, you can also visit online at CulturesOfDignity.com. Thank you again, and um, until your the, the next <laughs> talk or the next uh, book, I look forward to uh, hearing what you have to Thank say. Thank you, Lee. Mm -hmm. Thank you.